Welcome everyone to uh, another lecture in anatomy uh, and today I would like to talk to you about the anatomy of the thoracic wall and indeed uh, uh, it's two parts so I will start with the first uh, part. So let us define the thorax. When you say thorax that means you are indicating to an irregular shape cylinder as you see here in this figure with a, a narrow superior opening and uh, let us say large inferior opening in which these two openings uh, 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 connect the thorax or the thoracic cavity as you see here with the neck above and with the abdomen uh, below and when you say uh, thoracic wall that means you are indicating to um, let us say two parts skeletal elements and muscles so what you see in this figure is the skeletal element of the thoracic wall the muscles we will uh, leave it to the uh, second part of the um, for another lecture I mean and what you see here is the thoracic cage is the skeletal element of the thoracic wall that means when you say thoracic wall you are getting to the skeletal element and muscles and we will not say all the time skeletal element skeletal element no we can say thoracic cage simply this is the thoracic cage in which if you look to the thoracic cage in this figure you can um, simply uh, summarize the, let us say, the uh, borders of that cage or let us start from anteriorly for example so this cage guarded or bordered or consists anteriorly from the sternum and costal cartilage on both sides okay that's anteriorly laterally it's obviously here you have the ribs on both sides this cage guarded posteriorly or bordered or formed posteriorly by the thoracic vertebrae look at the vertebral column here so look at the thoracic vertebrae here so look at the intervertebral discs in between that means the thoracic cage, what you see here in this figure, consists anteriorly from the sternum and costal cartilage. Laterally, you have the ribs, and posteriorly, you have the vertebral, uh, let us say, thoracic vertebrae and the intervertebral disc in between. And in this figure, you look into the uh, to a natural bone. Again, this is the thoracic cage. Anteriorly, you have the sternum and costal cartilage. Laterally, you have the ribs on both sides. Posteriorly, you have the vertebral. Look at the vertebral column here. Look at the thoracic vertebrae and the intervertebral discs. And this is, let us say, um, anteriorly or anterior view, although we can see uh, a couple of structures posteriorly, but let us have a posterior view of the uh, skeletal element of the thoracic cage. Here, as you see, the spinous processes of the vertebral uh, column, and especially here, uh, I'm going to talk about the thoracic vertebrae. And look at the thoracic vertebrae, how they articulate with the ribs here posteriorly on both sides look at the articulation sides okay so we mentioned that the thoracic cage uh, consists anteriorly from the sternum where's the sternum this is what you see here is the sternum so the sternum you know you can feel it in the midline of your chest so it's located in the midline and we describe it as a flat bone right and it's not one uh, it's not a one piece as you thought it's composed or consists of three elements or three parts you can say the most superior one which is the manoprium 
and you have the body of a sternum itself and you have the xivoid process so you have three elements so let us start with the um, superior part for what we call it manuprium this is the manuprium or you can sometimes pronounce it as manuprium or you can say manuprium manuprium or manuprium is the same so this is the upper part of the sternum and interestingly you know when we talk about surface anatomy you have some time to indicate that this part is referred posteriorly like it's located at which level in respect to the vertebral column so if you take a horizontal plane posteriorly like this and from here because this is the manuprium right so it's located against the third and fourth uh, thoracic vertebrae right and what's most interestingly here if you put your finger up on the manuprium you will feel like a notch this notch we call it the jugular notch this is the jugular notch if you put your finger up all the way above the uh, upper limit of the sternum you will get this notch we call jugular notch or sometime you call it suprasternal notch suprasternal notch jugular notch or suprasternal notch is very important landmark this is about the uh this notch okay now what about the articulation of the manuprium well indeed it has two location or two articulate uh, two articular uh, sides for the clavicles one on the right and one on the left that means what articulates with the manuprium is uh, here we have the clavicle and also you have two locations for the first costal cartilage and the second costal cartilage but not the whole, not completely, the second costal cartilage is not completely, um, uh, it's not completely articulates with the manuprium. It also articulates with the body of the sternum itself. How? Let me explain that to you. So, again, this is the manuprium, this is the jugular notch, this is the articulation site for the clavicle, and here is the articulation site for the first costal cartilage that articulates with the first trip okay now the second costal cartilage has two facets one we call the upper facet and we have also it has the lower facet that means the upper facet of the second costal cartilage here articulates with the manuprium as you see here Right? while the lower facet of the second costal cartilage articulates with the body of a sternum itself okay so these are uh, but also uh, these are uh, the articulations with the um, manuprium but this is not the end because the manuprium articulates with the body of a sternum itself and this is at this very important uh, joint we call it manuprio sternal joint manuprio because between the manuprium and the body of the sternum but we don't use manuprio sternal joint we use something called sternal angle this is the sternum as a whole so this is the angle of a sternum because if you look to the sternum laterally it looks like this this is the manuprium and this is the it's not like this but that means here is the angle, right? This is the manuprium, this is the body of the sternum, this is the avoidable process. So this is the sternal angle. This is the sternal angle, which is very important landmark. Very important landmark. We will talk about it. So we um, described the uh, uh, manuprium, which is, uh, it means the handle right and now let us jump to the body of a sternum this is the body of a sternum it's in the the middle part of the sternum we call it the body and it articulates superiorly with the manuprium at the manuprium sternal 
joint or sternal angle and inferiorly the body of the sternum articulates with the xiphoidal process here uh, at the xiphi sternal joint xiphi sternal joint now this is the first two articulations the sternal angle or maneuver sternal joint and xiphi sternal joint okay what else so the body of the sternum also articulates with the second costal cartilage the third costal cartilage the fourth fifth sixth and seventh so what's interesting here i think i explained that to you in the previous slide you remember the second costal cartilage and we mentioned that the second costal cartilage uh, that of course will uh, articulate here with the second rib right anyway the second costal cartilage has two facets upper and lower the upper articulates with the manubrium the lower facet of the second costal cartilage articulates with the body of the sternum similarly the seventh costal cartilage has two facets again upper facet as you see here and lower facet the upper facet articulates with the body of the sternum itself while the lower facet articulates with the xiphoid process xiphoid process okay what's the xiphoid process yes this is the xiphoid process which is indeed a thin plate of cartilage it's a thin plate of cartilage but indeed uh, the xiphoid process like will become uh, ossified at adult and it becomes like a part with the uh, single part with the body of the sternum and if you look at the xiphoid process it has a demi facet as i mentioned for articulation with the inferior facet of the seventh costal cartilage and as i mentioned because this is the seventh costal cartilage that has two facets upper articulates with the body and lower facet articulates with the um, uh, the xiphoid uh, process and here is you know the xiphoid sternal joint between the xiphoid process and the body of the sternum and most importantly you can well you can uh, palpate your abdomen uh, and go up until you reach this part the xiphoid process and at this level you can tell that the xiphoid sternal joint located almost at the level of the ninth thoracic vertebrae ninth thoracic vertebra you remember again let me remind you that the manubrium located at the level of the third and fourth thoracic vertebrae while the xiphi sternal and sternal angle talk about it it's at the level of intercostal cartilage between the fourth and the fifth thoracic vertebrae at the intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae and here that means three four and here between four and five and this joint what we call xiphi sternal joint at the level of the ninth costal cartilage there is one way to uh, remember it i like always to um, uh, say it in this way how can i describe the surface anatomy of different joints here okay the manubrium at the level of uh, uh, third and uh, fourth thoracic uh, vertebrae while the sternal angle we'll talk about it it's at the level of intervertebral disc at the intervertebral disc that's okay between fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae that means this is the medicinal angle at the level of intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth while the four plus five four plus five that means we start at three four five it's equal to nine nine that means here the xiphysternal joint at the level of the ninth thoracic uh, vertebrae now let us um, describe a little let us talk a little bit about the sternal angle this is the um let, let, let me explain to you uh, a couple of things about the sternal angle this is the sternal angle or for what we call it manuprio uh, sternal joint we do use manuprio sternal joint we use sternal angle as i mentioned here is the manuprium and this is the body of the sternum so it's located here this is the sternal angle 
or the manubrial sternal joint if you take a hor as i mentioned if you take a horizontal uh, line you go back to the vertebral column it's located at the level of intervertebral disc between the fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae that means um, it's very important landmark it is you know why it's important because for many reasons we'll talk more about that in the cardiovascular system but for now it's the beginning of the arch of aorta and it's also the end at this level it's also the end of arch of aorta and also at this level sternal angle it's the bifurcation of the uh, trachea right into right and left uh, uh, main bronchus or what we call it the carina that's located here so also it's important because if you for example if you want to know this is rib number what so you have to go back to the sternal angle you can feel it it's a prominent in some people or if you don't know where is that or you cannot feel it like here it's or there or just put your finger here in the jugular notch which is very clear and obvious here put your finger here and go down a couple of centimeters you reach something like elevated up so this is the sternal angle right because it's like an elevation uh, here so when you reach here that means this is the sternal angle and this is the location of the second trip this is the second trip you now you start counting the ribs this is the second then you feel this this is the third then yes this is the fourth rib sometime you want to go to the fifth intercostal space that means this is the rib number five and you reach that point so we use it a very important prominent landmark to count the reps right okay um now to the uh reps and uh, again this is the uh, you see the thoracic cage and we mentioned that formed anteriorly by the sternum and costal cartilage and laterally formed by the ribs so how many rib we have we have 12 pairs of ribs that means we have 12 um, ribs on the right and 12 ribs on the left that means you have 24 um, ribs right or you can say 12 pairs so they are terminated anteriorly as you see in uh, coastal cartilage and when we describe the ribs it's not just we count them like 24 12 and right and left no we can classify them and just it's a kind of a description uh, we can classify them in, by two ways uh, the first uh, way to classify the ribs we can classify them into um, according to their attachment to the sternum look at the sternum look at the attachment of some of those ribs that means there are like for example number one two three four five six and rib number seven all they are all they are attached to the sternum directly by their coastal cartilage that means they are attached to the sternum that means we call them true ribs that means ribs from number one to seven they are true ribs because they are attached anteriorly by the coastal cartilage directly to the sternum while the from number um, eight to twelve that means number eight nine ten uh, 11 is here and 12 we call them false ribs not true we call them false ribs because they are not attached to the sternum uh, uh, by their costal cartilage directly right and we can sometimes some authorities they um, uh, uh, subdivided the uh, false ribs into also floating ribs be the i mean here we indicate to rib number 11 and rib number 12 if you look at the tip of them you would see that they are not attached to anything anteriorly that means they are floating uh, 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 in the chest that means we call them floating ribs 
we are indicating to number 11 and 12. But anyway, you can also say, yes, 11 and 12 parted from the false ribs because they are not attached to the uh, sternum. Well, just we're describing the how we categorize the ribs. Okay, that means here is the true ribs and here is, guys, the false ribs, of course, on both sides. And 11 number 12, we can say, yes, they are also floating ribs because they don't attach uh, even uh, anteriorly to another like cartridge or so uh, let me just explain one thing again here guys to you in which look at number eight nine and ten yes they don't attach to the sternum direct directly by their coastal cartilage instead they united to each other to form this coastal cartilage and then this coastal cartilage of these three ribs eight nine ten they united or join the it joins the coastal cartilage of uh, rib number seven here right so it joins it um, just to get an attachment, right? While, you know, the coastal cartridge of number 7, as you see here, attached uh, directly uh, to the sternum. Anyway, this is about this classification, according to attachment to the sternum or not, true and false ribs. Now, what about the, uh, according to uh, their uh, structure? What does it mean? It means that we can classify the ribs according to uh, some of features that should be present in, uh, like in uh, uh, in the rib. <coughs> Sorry. So we have typical ribs and we have atypical, or let us say non-typical. So typical um, uh, ribs, they are from number three to nine right while the atypical or what we call them non-typical those ribs they don't have the characteristics of the typical ones those the first two and last three that means uh you know we have from one to twelve so the typical from three to nine that means still we have number one and two and we have number ten 11 and 12 that means the first two and last three they are atypical that means number one and two 10 11 and 12 they are atypical that means non-typical okay the easier way to remember them you can say the first two and the last three just to memorize they are atypical or let us say non-typical okay we describe the true rib and false uh, uh, true ribs and false ribs and we mentioned the floating ribs i don't want to iterate it again so yes as we talk about the other classification the typical and atypical we mentioned that the typical ribs they are from three number from rib number three up to rib number nine that means rib number three four five six seven eight and nine okay what are the characteristics that should be in the rib to say it's a, a, it is a typical rib yani, uh, in arabic we say um what's the what's those characteristics first of all it has to has a head so this is the head of the rib the head of the rib just to uh, remind you that it articulates with the uh, vertebrae in the back right with the thoracic vertebrae in the back so this is the head so the head is posteriorly um, uh, just to uh, keep it in your mind first of all the rib has to have a head and the head has two uh, facets or let us call them demi facets let us maximize it and have a look here so look at the head this is the head of the rib and it has two demi facets so those for articulation with the um, uh, uh, thoracic vertebrae in the back so you have a smaller superior demi facet and you have large uh, inferior demi facets you can call it upper demi facet and lower demi facet right it's not completely a facet a facet is like a complete circle it's sometime it's like not a complete facet like this we call it demi facet 
right? So you have two uh, the facets, the smaller upper uh, one and large um, uh, and large uh, demi lower demi facet upper and lower very simple and in between or uh, between these two demi facets you have a small protruded bone which is the crest look at it here and look at it here this is the uh, crest of the head of the rib between the two demi facets now why you have superior or upper and lower demi facets where they will articulate let us move back and look at here so you look and here is the sternum and here is anteriorly and here is uh, the vertebral column posteriorly you look into the right lateral side right lateral side of the chest and what is this rib this is rib number five this is the fifth rib okay this is the fifth rib okay so the fifth rib this is the head of the fifth rib that means this head it's typical right it is typical that means is it has two demi facets one is upper demi facet and you have large lower demi facets so you have upper and lower demi facets so rib number five will articulate with thoracic vertebrae number four and number five so the rib number five or the upper fa demi facets of rib number five articulates with the demi facets of the thoracic vertebra number four that means the um, uh, uh, typical uh, uh, thoracic vertebra has the typical one i'm talking about the vertebra now has superior demi facet and inferior demi facet so uh, again this is rib number five so it articulates with it is uh let me erase this so it articulates with its upper demi facets with the uh, vertebra above right that means it's rib number five it articulates with thoracic vertebra number four and the corresponding vertebra the same number i mean also number five you see here so by its two demi facets the upper demi facet um, articulates with the small um, a lower demi facet on each side of the vertebra above it that means this is rib number five the superior or upper demi facet articulates with the vertebra above it which is number four while the lower <coughs> demi facet which is larger it articulates with the also large um, upper demi facet of the side of the vertebra right of the same number rib number five with the vertebra thoracic vertebra number five with its lower demi facet okay so this is about the so always remember that the rib articulates with the i'm going to talk about the typical rib art from three to nine they uh, these ribs articulate with the um vertebra above it and with the corresponding vertebra right the same number rib number five articulates with the four and five all right this is correct for ribs from three to nine okay what else what's the typical rib should um, have other than the head yes after the head you have a constriction which is the neck which is like flat constricted next to the uh, part next to the head okay what else ah the rib has a tubercle let us have a look from here laterally that means let us move here so again this is the head you already know with two demi facets and this is the constricted part which is the um neck that means okay lateral to it my friends also you can see it from here here is the head here is the neck and here is the tubercle so the tubercle my friends this is the tubercle can be divided into two parts right articular part and non-articular uh, part what does it mean 
Yes, both we call them tubercles. But the tubercles here are uh, divided into two parts. One will be articulated with the transverse uh, process of the vertebra, and one has no articulation with another bone. That means it's just for um, attachment of ligaments, right? So this is the articular um, facet, which is uh, close to the neck, close to the head and neck. We can say, we can call them the medial part because, you know, here is the vertebra, right? That means here is the midline. That means the articular part is the medial one, while the non-articular part is the lateral one. Back to the articular part. You see the facet here? So it has a circular facet uh, that will be articulates with the um, transverse process of the vertebra of the same number. What does it mean? Back here, look at this. Let me use this pen. Uh, yes, look at the rib number five. Yes, it articulates with the corresponding vertebra like number five and with the that one above it, number four. But look at this is the head of the ribs, of the rib, and this is the neck. And this is the tubercle. The tubercle has two parts, the articular part, here you see, and non-articular part. The articular part, you see here, articulates with the transverse process of the vertebra. This is the vertebra, this is the vertebra. So the vertebra, um, each vertebra has transverse process. Transverse process, this is the transverse process. And the transverse process has a facet on it. So like here, right? So, so look at the rib number five that uh, has articular facet. Here, that articulates with the facet on the transverse process of vertebra number five, right? Corresponding vertebra. That means here the articular part that you see here, my friends, with the middle articulated with the circle facet on the tip of the transverse process of the vertebra of the same number, okay? Anyway, now just move a little bit laterally. That means if this is the articular part, here is like, should be or if it is here, look laterally here, this part is the non-articular part, which is lateral one, and is attached to the lateral costal transverse ligament. Yes, you remember the transverse process here. That means the rib should be, um, the rib should be connected to the transverse process by a ligament. This is lateral one, we call it lateral costal transverse costal from ribs. Transverse from transverse process. So this ligament is the lateral, lateral costal transverse ligament. Okay, so that means the typical uh, rib has head, neck, tubercle, and has also an angle, which is which is the sharp. I would say the sharp point um, to move like the um, rib from the back anterior laterally. Here is the angle, right? Here is the point of the angle. And you have also the shaft. So these characteristics, a plus. Uh, a plus to the, uh, I will uh, mention also more about the characteristic of the first rib, other than the head, neck, tubercle, angle, shaft. Also, it has upper border, you see here, and lower border. And it has lateral surface, listen, lateral or external surface and medial surface, not upper and lower surface. No, the rib has the same look. It's like um, in this shape. It's not a flat. It's a flat, but look at the direction. Look at the upper border and lower border. So look at the lower border also. One of the most interesting feature here in the lower border of the rib you have a small group small groove along the whole rib but it's a very obvious my friends here you can see there is a small groove here called coastal groove the coastal groove uh, is important because um, it creates a kind of um, a protection which is like a space for the intercoastal nerves and 
and intercostal vessels so they pass from there we will talk about uh, them later um, in this uh, in respiratory uh, system right this is the uh, characteristic of typical uh, uh, ribs now that means typical ribs from three to nine what about the atypical or non-typical that means number one and number two and the first two and the last three the last three would be uh, 10 11 and 12 let us have a look on the first rib why is the why the first rib is atypical well it's like C shape the first one and it has not lateral surface and medial surface it has upper surface it's like flat it's like flat um, so it has upper surface and lower surface right and here is the head which um, uh, of course uh, the head here has just one facet you know that typical head should um, has uh, upper and lower demi facets but here the first rib has just um, one facet that articulates with the first thoracic vertebra which is T1 right the first thoracic vertebra so it has also one um, facet not two demi facets okay it has a head and neck and the tubercle but most interestingly my friends yes it has uh, inner border and outer border but as i mentioned it has superior and inferior surfaces let us um see what's uh, the problem also with the first step other than c shape cared have one has one uh, facets on the head and so forth it has very important two grooves look the first one this is the right first rib right so you look into this this is this one right but anyway look at the features here and look at it here so this is the first strip and look it's you know that uh, already articulates with the uh, manubrium right anyway look at the upper surface of the first rib it has two very important grooves grooves on the bone the first anterior one which is for subclavian vein you see here this one is this one is the location for here is the subclavian group for subclavian vein posterior to it you have another groove which is for subclavian artery you see the sub groove for subclavian artery in between you have a rough area for attachment of the muscle in between here that means the subclavian vein and subclavian artery they are separated by a muscle we call it scalenus anterior scalenus anterior here is the attachment of scalenus anterior muscle that you see here right so also you can see here here is the first um, rib and has two grooves on its upper surface the first anterior groove for subclavian vein and the posterior one for subclavian artery and in between there is a rough area for attachment of a muscle called scalenus anterior muscle that you see here that separates the vein anteriorly from the artery posteriorly right also um what's behind here the artery is the location of the or uh, where we have here the lower trunk of bra brachial plexus you see this one the lower trunk of brachial plexus that you see uh, here posterior to all of these trunks you have another rough area right which is not for scalenus anterior no it's for scalenus medius right where is that this is the let me erase it look here is the scalenus medius right so if this is the rib so it has a rough area here for attachment of scalenus medius right i don't care too much about that it's like more too much details but if you have a look like just anterior to the neck you know here is the head and neck of the first rib here is the t1 vertebra in the back but just anterior to the neck you have two nerves and two vessels so from medial because this is medial from medial to lateral you have sympathetic chain and i like to jump here the 
T uh, ventral ramus of T1 nerve root that passes here, and you have the uh, what do we call it, the um, intercostal vein and the superior intercostal uh, artery, right? So jump to the second rib. Uh, uh, in the second rib, still, uh, it's a flat, right? It has upper surface, lower surface again. Um, yes, it has two demi facets for articulation with the uh, the same number. This is rib number two. That means articulates with thoracic vertebra number two and with the T1 as well. It has an ich, yes, it has tubercle, but it has, um, why it's atypical also, it has a tuberosity on its um, uh, upper surface here, which is a tuberosity for serratus anterior um, muscle. Yes, we mentioned the serratus anterior here. Look, this is the serratus anterior between the subclavian vein and artery. So it has a tubercle here on the first rib, but also it has also attachment to this to the second rib as well. So serratus anterior originates here, or it has attachment to the not just the first rib as you see here, but also to the second rib as you see here, right? So the attachment from the first and from the uh, second. Now the uh, now the atypical also we mentioned the last three number 10, 11 and 12. So number 10, the rib number 10, why it's atypical because it has a single articular facets on it his head because you know it, it should has two demi facets but it's atypical because um, uh, it has just one facet on its head. That means it articulates with only with vertebra number T10. It's a number, rib number 10. So it articulates just with thoracic vertebra number 10, not with also T9. Because you know, the typical, the typical rib should articulate with the same number and the, the vertebra above it. No, it's just with number 10. Also, now to the uh, 11 and the 12, the floating uh, uh, ribs. Uh, so also they have only one facet similar to the number 10. That means number 10, 11 and the 12, they have just only one facet on the head. And uh, they have, but uh, uh, number 11 and 12, what I want to summarize, uh, what I want to say, let us summarize it. They don't have, I would say, most of things that's related to the rib. So they, they have just one facet. They don't have neck. They don't have a tubercle. And even you don't see like a sharp, uh, really angle, especially in number 12. Although you can also hear a little bit. But they are floating ribs. They don't attach anteriorly to anything. That's why the kidneys that's located here um, are more prone for injury, especially when there is a case of falling down and there is like a um, uh, fracture for any of those um, ribs because, you know, the rib when it's fractured, it becomes like a knife. So uh, the kidneys like um, become more prone to be like injured.